So once you've cleaned your negative off really, really well, and you've checked out the, your scanner at the issue room with the appropriate holder, you want to turn the Imacon scanner on by lowering the bed and placing the bed into position that's appropriate for the format of your film. The flat position is for mounted 35 millimeter, and the slanted position is for flexible films. Clean your film off really well, put it in the holder, and put it um, on the flex tight Imacon bed so that it snaps into place. Next, you're going to go ahead and launch a program called Flex Color. The program called Flex Color is only on the machine that's attached to the Imacon. You'd, if you don't see it in the dock, chances are that you'll probably have to go into the CCSF hard drive and find it. And it's going to be called the Flex Color. There's two. There's the flex tight and then the flex color. Probably, actually, this is the most recent one. Um, so launch the most recent one instead. I'm going to take this one out of the dock. Um, so it looks like it's updating the firmware. That's good. Once we have the software loaded into place, and, um, it's taking its own sweet time, there's a series of choices here that you really want to spend time with because they're important. The setup size, um, you are, uh, we currently have a 4x5 C41 negative, which means that we're going to choose a negative RGB standard. So it's a negative, we're working in the RGB color model, and we're just going to choose standard because honestly a lot of these films don't exist anymore and it's best if we do the color correction in Photoshop um, at this point. Next thing that's important is the frame size. The frame size is indicated on the frame that you choose and that gets loaded into the Imacon. So if you're unsure because maybe you don't use this kind of metric system in your language, check on the side of the flex type frame and you'll see what the appropriate size is. Our mode is RGB. Even if you're, um, unless you were scanning a, a black and white negative, in which case I would choose grayscale 16-bit. Uh, we're going to choose RGB 16-bit because we know that 16 bits per pixel gives us more color information than standard 8 bits per pixel. So really your only two choices when you're scanning, in my opinion, are RGB 16-bit and grayscale 16-bit. Now we're ready to preview the image. This can take some time, so right now we're listening to the whir of the Imacon as it um, sucks in the 4x5 film. And they've stopped investing money in scanning technology, so, and most companies now are investing their money in digital camera technology, so some of these um, scans can take some time. It looks like there was a light leak in our 4x5 film sometime at some point, so I would check to make sure the holder works okay, and I would also check to make sure that you're loading the film correctly. Sometimes if it's accidentally loaded at an angle, this can also cause a light leak. So next thing I'm going to do is select the area that I want to scan. From an archival standpoint, it's actually recommended that you scan a little more of the area than you intend. That um, shows that as the artist, you're showing us the whole image with no cropping. But that's optional. If you were working for a library or a museum, you would definitely do that. So I'm just going to leave it a little open. Then we're going to call up our histogram. And our histogram shows us a pixel map of the image from blacks to whites, and I'm going to make sure that this histogram in scanning is pulled out pretty flat so that we get uh, the lowest contrast image possible. This is so that we capture all of the pixel information in our original scan. We can always use Photoshop later to go ahead and adjust the contrast, but it's really important, and what we're looking for is that we get um, all of the information in our scan. You can also call up cur uh, this if you prefer. Honestly, um, 
I wouldn't use the sliders. I would just close that. I would pay attention to the histogram, make sure these, this is slid all the way out. And there's some funny stuff happening in this image because it's, it, there's a light leak and it's slightly underexposed. It looks like the meter was for the background on the trees and not for the figure on the bench. So um, the figure is a couple stops underexposed. We can see what we can do with it though. The next thing you want to do is decide on a size. It makes it really easy. If you're going to output to a light jet print, 300 PPI suggested. Um, you can also simply just choose the highest level PPI. Notice though it gives you a really big file size. So you really want to spend some time calculating and thinking which file size is appropriate. Um, one of the things I notice is that this likes to um, default to centimeters, which is not something you know that we're accustomed to using. So um, there is a metric choice here, which you can change to inches. Um, so we're going to talk about what size we want the image to be, maybe eight by ten. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger than eight by ten because um, that leaves you some room to consider cropping it later and so forth without losing resolution. Uh, so it looks like we want this to be 10.5, let's say. So we're going to do a 9 by 10 and a half. That's a 247% enlargement from the original. It's going to give us a 50 megabyte file approximately at 300 pixels per inch. Next thing um, you want to do is uh, it should automatically focus the image, but let me know if you have trouble with that. Um, Okay, I would stay away from this auto corrections button, even though it's clear um, uh, that there's a color shift. Um, I would probably take care of that more in Photoshop. Um, but, you know, if you wanted to work with some of the um, color corrections here, you could try it. Um, this in the curves adjustment tool is like the neutral eyedropper, but I'm going to guess that that might be a gray color. That's blue, so that wouldn't work. But we could kind of work with some of the color shifts here. Um, but you might choose to, and you, we can also try to brighten the image a little bit. But we are, we are working with a negative, so it does have fairly good latitude. Um, and sometimes, you know, doing this uh, at the scanning level can help the quality of your original, and sometimes it really doesn't make a difference at all. But we'll try it. Okay. All right. Um, so once we're done with that, we, can, we have to close everything, and then we can choose to make the final scan. Making the final scan, we want to select to save it on the desktop, and then you'll migrate it and back it up onto your hard drive when you're finished. So I'm going to call this scan one, uh, sun, and we'll save it as a TIFF. A lot of people forget that TIFF is the um, has the ability to support 16-bit mode and it's non-destructive. So we're going to say save. So now the scanner is has inserted the film again, and it'll go ahead and do a. Um, nice long pass over it and you might have to wait several minutes for it to do the scanning job because again it does take its own sweet time and here we have the final scan being generated if you go like this it makes it go faster just kidding <laughs> I learned this in graduate school it was a very expensive lesson okay so uh, that's actually not bad. That's not taking very long as, at all. Um, obviously, larger megabyte scans are going to take much longer. So you're finished here, and you can quit, or you can choose to uh, do some more scans. Once, once you've scanned the image, you're going to take it into Photoshop. And once it's in Photoshop, we're going to go ahead and crop the image the way that we want it cropped and look at it for any dust. Um, it's really not advisable that you scan pictures without first dusting them with some kind of air or dusting device. I prefer compressed air. If you, obviously, not everybody has compressed air. If you don't have compressed air, you can use canned air, but be careful with canned air because it can spit up uh, that uh, freon material. 
So I'm going to go ahead now and um, rotate the image counterclockwise so it's the right direction. And we're going to go ahead and crop it. You can enter in at this time if you want an exact uh, 8 by 10 crop. And you can get a little creative if you want to with the crop. Oops, I didn't mean to crop it so soon. We'll leave it there for now and you can go back and adjust it. Um, and then if you had a gray card in the picture in the first one, in the first exposure, then you could do your gray card um, or you can work with um, you know, what might, might be something naturally neutral in nature. Um, but I don't know what that would be since he's wearing a blue shirt. Uh, maybe I'll click on the white area here. That's a little bit better, but there's still some lightly color issues here that we need to deal with. Um, then you can zoom in and we see the grain of the, the um, image. The grain is kind of exaggerated because it was underexposed. You should have finer grain structure. I'm going to go back and click on my background image. And this is something that we learned in my Photoshop class, how to make a retouching layer. And the retouching layer always has to sit on top of the background layer. We're going to go ahead and choose my favorite tool for skin, which is the healing brush. Make sure that it's in current and below so that it samples the current layer and what's below it. And we can go ahead and option click in a good area and click over the dust. This area right here, it, there's some shadow transition, so it's a little tricky. Might have to use a smaller brush or use the cloning tool. So we would go ahead and do that for a while until we were satisfied. Okay, it might take some time. I like to use the navigator tool and go up to the very edge and kind of start and do what's called the lawnmower technique, like you're mowing a lawn in suburbia, just like that. We go through and we would retouch it really well. Then we're going to choose to save the image. And this is going to be our retouched image so that we have a nice clean original before we start um, doing special effects and so forth on it. Um, now you can save the image, just to back up a little bit, as a layered TIFF, which is what I did. Um, layered TIFFs are um, open source and non-proprietary, so it should last into eternity, uh, but they are larger than a Photoshop file. So you can, you can also choose to save it as a Photoshop file if you'd like. That's a good on using the Imicon. If you have any questions, be sure to ask a lab attendant or your instructor as this is a delicate and expensive machine.